Okay, welcome to the uh, fourth meeting of the uh, President's Export Council. We, uh, like, like always, we have a lot of material, so let's get started. Listen, last week uh, we made a lot of progress, and that's last week. And even prior to last week, we made a lot of progress on a number of fronts. But APEC, uh, and I think Mike Froman later in the morning is going to give us an update uh, on, that, on that meeting. Everything from FTAs to trade agreements to related things, a lot's going on out there. Uh, I, I also want to thank Rob Hendrickson uh, uh, and now Ambassador Bobby Mandel for their service to the Council. Uh, Rob is stepping down at the end of the year, and last month the Senate confirmed Bobby to be the U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg. They have both made valuable contributions uh, to the Council, as all of us remember, and they will be missed. Now, let's welcome my old friend uh, Bill Daly, White House Chief of Staff, who will introduce our newest member, Commerce Secretary John Bryson. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, old friend. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thanks One of us user. is old, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I look around, there's a lot of us. Um, anyways, let me uh, thank Jim, um, and let me, uh, once again, on behalf of the President, thank all of the uh, members of the, uh, of the uh, PEC for the time you take out of your busy schedules from your businesses, from your lives, to, to uh, help uh, this country, help the economy, and to uh, uh, really spend time to give advice to, uh, to us. And I thank all of the members of the Cabinet and the administrators that are here and all of the administration people who have who are here with you today uh, obviously uh, uh, a lot has happened first let me thank you all uh, a lot of po very positive things have happened lately the three trade agreements and TAA that was passed I thank uh, so many of the people in this room who worked awfully hard for those to be passed um, took a long time a lot longer than any of us wanted but I think in the end, we're very pleased that it is going to increase jobs in this country. It's going to strengthen our relationship with uh, allies that uh, have been strong friends of the United States and give opportunities to American workers that uh, have not been there. So we thank you for the, the work. Uh, and everyone in this room really, uh, I know, spent a lot of time on it, and especially Jim as chairman um, of this uh, group, uh, really, really spent a lot of time on it. So I thank you all for that. Um, Couple of, I know Froman is going to give an update on APEC. Uh, let me just say your chairman um, did a wonderful imitation of Charlie Rose as he interviewed uh, uh, the president. Uh, and I, I think the APEC meeting was very successful. Um, there is a uh, strong desire by the president um, to, to focus and continue to strengthen the focus on Asia and the opportunities uh, for engagement with uh, friends throughout Asia. And I think the, f the feeling at that meeting was uh, very much positive about the U.S. engagement uh, over the next number of years in Asia and the opportunities that present themselves there for U.S. businesses and uh, for uh, export growth. So I thank you, Jim, for that uh, interview. I think the President uh, did a great job of pointing out the opportunities that are there for us and the need for us to get more competitive um, here in this country. Uh, and therefore be more competitive around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, a, a new member uh, of the administration, uh, someone that I've known for a while, uh, extremely successful in business, uh, someone who uh, uh, has sacrificed, as many people do, to go into government. Uh, took a lot longer to get his confirmation done than any of us would have wanted, but it is the uh, times we live in, um, in this town, that uh, everything seems to take a little longer than uh, the American people would like, and surely uh, uh, on things that we as administration would like to get done. But it got done, uh, and so we're extremely uh, proud of John's hit the ground running at APEC uh, last week, um, and he's leaving, I know, today uh, after this meeting for China for the JCCT with a number of other colleagues from the administration. So um, as I introduced John the day he, um, after he was um, Confirmed by the Senate, I said he has the opportunity to be the second greatest Commerce Secretary in the history of the country. <laughs> so, uh, so I th hope he takes advantage of that opportunity. So let me introduce to you, John Bryson. John? Well, uh, really, I'm honored to be introduced by Bill 
We actually spent a lot of time together out at APEC, but a lot of time every previous step along the way, and he did everything he could to move my confirmation along. Just that I was a tough case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, it's such a pleasure to work with Bill and work with the members of this administration, many of whom are around the table. I uh, said so I'm now three weeks into the job, so I'm really, really way into this. Uh, this is the fourth meeting. It's my first, but I'm really delighted to be with you. I think what you're doing makes a difference. It makes a huge difference, and I've been th able to go through the letters of recommendations you're making, and they're practical, and they're sad, and the kinds of things that are based on what business people can offer, including a sense of urgency, including a really highly specific means of keeping track of what we're doing here, and I commend that a lot. Leaders of the business community and the labor community together, I think, are bringing in valuable insights. I'm very pleased that members of Congress are with us here as well, and um, I'd simply say that I and we count on your advice, and that's vitally important to us. I'm going to talk a little about exports, uh, but I'm not going to go very far into what I might say because you know so much about it all already. Uh, reality, as I say, from the day I've arrived at the Commerce Department, that we have a fragile economy in this country. It's moved forward some, but we, what we have beyond that is a jobs crisis. I mean, the levels of unemployment are really, really, really low. And notwithstanding the fact we have now 20 weeks in a row of improved jobs reports, and we were actually delighted we are out at OPEC, APEC, and we got the report on September, you know, it was a meaningful step up, still way too little relative to what we need to have. And I've talked a lot, some of you, we were talking around breakfast this morning, what this means for older people, for middle-aged people, but particularly for the young people that are potentially entering the workforce now and don't find anything, and what that does for the disciplines they need to have, but also their sense of opportunity in this country is something we've got deeply to address. So that's going to be kind of the heart of my highest priority. It's really the President's highest priority sets it out extremely well. And I think all of you understand that what I exports mean is opportunities for U.S.-based businesses to provide more jobs, right? Exports provide revenues. They require that we come forth with the products we can best provide, and jobs follow that. So that's incredibly important, and that's true across not just, of course, the larger businesses in our country, but the small and the medium-sized businesses, and I've been meeting with a lot of those. And there, that's an area in which the financing and support of them is not so great. You know, those that have very prominent and high stature credit, as usual, they can get financing, and financing in favorable terms, but the little guys, not so much. And for example, the manufacturing base among the little guys in this country is extraordinary really talented people with drive, and they're looking all the time, but they don't know so much about the export world. So as you know, probably heard these figures, what is it, something like 98% of the businesses in the country don't export at all, and then even among those that do, the fraction that go only to one country is very, very high. So this is an opportunity in the waiting. We can really do something about it. Uh, and the kinds of practical recommendations you're making in these meetings are really the core of learning. So mostly what I'm going to do is listen today, and I could take you through the statistics here, and the statistics are stunning, on how we've come under the President's initiative. You've played a big role in that. You know that. But I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we took any kind of complacency with respect to our ability to hit the full doubling target. So what, for example, about the European financial crisis now and how might that affect our exports and obviously exports to Western Europe, even to Eastern Europe, have been a big part of our export scheme and you have to believe there are going to be some impacts there and plenty of others. Um, we've talked about APEC. Mike Froman will come in on talk about that and he'll present it very, very well. Gene Sperling, I suspect you're going to talk a little about that as well. Uh, the, this was my first participation in APEC. And 
you know, what only stands out, I would say, is the strength with which this administration is addressing opportunities for businesses in our country, balancing the playing field, advocating what U.S. businesses best offer, working hard with the themes of innovation, of creation, of entrepreneurship, but also just plain really capable people who keep finding niches. And it was exciting for me to be a part of this, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to do many of my own meetings one-on-one -on -one with the countries around the world uh, with, our, with our commerce team there. And then I had uh, the final day with the president going through these critical meetings. Uh, and, you know, we are hitting it as hard. And with the president's leadership, I think very effectively about the kinds of things we knew, knew, need to do to take that further. I'm just going to stop there. I could give you statistics. You know them all. But mainly what I want to say is a big, big thanks to all of you for your support on the free trade agreements, your support in this area. And I appreciate your giving your time to those of us in the federal government on this exports issue. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both the uh, but for the encouragement and the leadership, that's what, that's what really gets us up in the morning and for recognition of some of the success that some of my colleagues have had in leading these initiatives. You mentioned the small business one, and I was just looking at Fred, Chairman Hochberg over there, and the small business supplier financing initiative, which is a first big step in the direction you're encouraging, John, that just has rolled out. and we. We see it and are already working it with banks and with our supply base. And so uh, you'll probably mention that a little bit later, but I acknowledge that. Ursula, do you have any comments before we charge ahead? Uh, just short uh, welcome, Secretary Bryson. It's good to have you on board. You do have um, big shoes to fill. Um, we've made a lot of progress, and I look forward to just making more with you um, at our side. So thank you for coming on board. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ursula. I think it's important uh, to point out at this point, and, and believe it or not, we've been at this for 18 months, uh, to look at where we are on implementing our first 15 letters of recommendations. We've been, our output, our letters to the, uh, to, to the President uh, after working with you to make sure the wording is right and the recommendations make sense. Um, and we actually uh, went through a uh, discussion at our last meeting where, where a few of the few of the members said, hey, should we stop and look where we are and uh, give ourselves a sense of uh, completion of implementation, challenges yet in front of us uh, against uh, a number of the major areas? And the PEC staff has prepared a stoplight chart, uh, which will help us briefly re review the progress. I'll highlight a few, and then I'll turn to other members to perhaps make some comments. Uh, the best news I can report is that Ursula, Pat, Jim, and I witnessed the, did witness the historic signings of the FTAs with Korea, Colombia, and Panama last month. And uh, so that recommendation is solid green, thanks to leadership uh, at the uh, cabinet level uh, here. Uh, on export control reform, I'm, I'm pleased to report that the administration has continued to make progress. I think we have a real opportunity here after living through many, many years of not much progress there. I think uh, Secretary uh, Gates' initial initiative is, was very welcome. And we, in a meeting with Secretary Panetta yesterday, a subset of this group, very pleased to see his commitment to push through with your team, John, and with, the, and with State uh, to, to follow through on those recommendations. Uh, it did publish a draft rule for Category 8, uh, rash, rationalizing the controls on aircraft. Uh, and aircraft parts and components, uh, a great place to start, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so the, um, uh, on XM, bills are ready for floor action and uh, in the House and Senate next year with the administration's support. Uh, I think we're at a level that can support uh, the exports, but it's not done yet, but we're, we're all in, and we're going to try to engage everybody to help uh, Chairman Hochberg get there. And on tax reform, there is a lot of work going on, but it's a little early to predict what's happening. I mean, it's all caught up in the budget thing. So, um, you know, be before I ask uh, Secretary Bryson to make some comments uh, and uh, Chairman Hochberg, I know Gene is really on a tight 
schedule. And so uh, if I could just insert sort of as, as a sidebar here, because uh, uh, Gene Sperling, we're fortunate to have him with us. And some comments from you as we're moving through this would really be appreciated. And then we'll, then we'll come back to the stoplight chart. I will be uh, uh, brief for two reasons. One, uh, uh, you don't need more uh, uh, intro uh, remarks. And two, uh, I actually have to go run uh, uh, a meeting that deals with some of the issues you were just raising. So uh, in the furtherance of, of this, we are obviously in the point where we are getting ready for our next budget and next day of the union. I'll make four points pretty quickly. One is that, as you've seen, um, you know, trade, as difficult as it is, uh, does tend to, you know, if you keep your head down, you can overperform political expectations. And Bill and I and Lael and others remember 99 and 2000 when it was supposed to be complete lame duck, done, ended up being uh, an enormously successful year in terms of China WTO, in terms of the Africa Trade Agreement, other things. You know, here, uh, 2011, one of the most divisive years probably and most weak economic, probably, probably the, the, sorry, the, the worst combination of political divisiveness and a bad economy that you've seen. And yet, uh, it's going to, you know, when the new year comes, 2011 will have been quite a successful year on trade. We're still pushing on TPP, still pushing on Jackson Vanek. Uh, but it does, it does show me that, that, that you can overperform in, in this area uh, just by moving the ball forward. Uh, you do have the op opportunity for bipartisanship here that you don't always have. So for all the difficulties, uh, uh, I think this is a good lesson. And I know a lot of people will kind of do the discounting for 2012. And I would just say, don't listen. You know, just keep, you know, head down, just keep going forward. You never know how the environment changes. You never know when people decide they want to show accomplishment, get something done. So I've seen this before. Uh, you can overperform uh, political expectations on trade and, ex and exports. Uh, we're enormously committed here. You can see that from our chief of staff. You can see that from the efforts Mike Froman puts in, but also just from the, the depth of the economic team from uh, uh, the, John Bryson and, and Secretary Solis and Karen Mills and others. Um, secondly, in light of that, the focus on exports, particularly because of the jobs focus, becomes that much more important. This is the part you, 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 that is the part, the only, and really the only part the public can really understand. That may be unfortunate that they can't understand fully the benefits of, uh, you know, uh, more competition from imports and lower prices and innovation. Those things are all true. They're very difficult to explain. It is the exports that is our, our chance to kind of communicate to the average person that, that's, that this is about more jobs. Um, third point I'd make go something Bill was saying, which is that the role that you play on the broader pragmatism is so important right now. And, you know, what happened on trade adjustment assistance and the FTAs is just a perfect example of that. That was the only way you were going to get the consensus for this to pass. And you have a lot of people who just wanted to rail against the free trade agreements. You had a lot of people who wanted them and didn't want to do anything for workers. And I think the business community played an awfully important role in, in you know, kind of breaking through the politics and saying, yes, you can be for free trade agreements and helping workers. And I think it's worth thinking of that in a broader sense, too. Uh, the more I think the people who are pushing the export agenda are part of the workforce agenda, uh, the more, again, you're, 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 you're paving ground for that uh, uh, bipartisan consensus uh, that goes beyond the politics and, and I think paves room for more uh, uh, possibilities of, of that, that rare bipartisan legislative achievement. Um, obviously, the other thing you've seen from us is uh, legislative achievements are difficult, so we do wake up every morning. And this is in Bill's White House now. We, uh, what we can do without Congress uh, is, is just a part of our, of our day, every single day. And so there's a greater focus. Uh, I mean, there's always focus there, but there's a greater energy and focus that Bill's instilled and, uh, you know, you just find there is more you can do. And I think this is another place where if you can say, 
you know, I mean, here's something you can do on the custom side. Here's something that could be a big, make a big difference. This could break through. Uh, maybe in 2009 with the world crashing, that wouldn't have got focus. But I think right now we are giving the focus to those type of things. So in terms of your recommendations, Jim, there is a lot more attention and focus now on the executive action. And then the final thing I just say, and I'm not trying to do an advertisement for the American Jobs Act, I'm really not for a particular package, but we've got to be focused on growth. I mean, you guys have seen the European numbers. For, uh, they're just terrible, for, even beyond the crisis. Uh, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Netherlands, either zero or contractionary in the third quarter. Um, and that's besides the overall risk of crisis there. Our blue chip projections are 2% growth, 2.1, 2.2. That is not even enough to bring the unemployment rate down. Um, and the idea, and people are not going to support all the things we're trying to do unless they see that connection. And even if a particular company can get by, I promise you this, our crisis of long-term unemployment will not, will get worse and worse at 2% growth. Right now, we are amidst the worst long-term uh, unemployment crisis in our lifetimes. In the re deep recession of 1981-82, the average length of unemployment was 21 weeks. The average length today is 40 weeks. If you have 2% growth, people can just hire a little bit, take the most attractive candidates. They do not reach to the people who have been out of work a year, year and a half, two years. And that means that what is basically a demand and temporary unemployment issue will start to feed into the structural issue as people become unemployed. We all know, unemployed for five, six months, terrible pain and inconvenience. Unemployed for a year and a half, you lose your house. Sadly, people often lose their spouse. They lose their health. They become more and more disconnected. So we've got to get the growth going in the next year, year and a half. Uh, it's just essential. It's essential for an export agenda, but I think it's, a, it's essential generally, and I think that just has to be part of everyone's uh, uh, agenda. And with that, I have to run, but thank you very much. Gene, Gene thank you very much. You know, it's uh, the focus on execution and the evidence thereof is really motivational for us, so we really appreciate yeah. the comments. Okay. John, did you have any comments uh, as we're sort of halfway through the stoplight chart? Do you want to? We have the free trade agreements. Well, let me just yeah. say, as Gene walks out, covering the entire national economy, head of the National Economic Council, he is tireless. He's done it before, and he covers it spectacularly well. And he provides insight and leadership for all of us. Uh, so he makes a difference. So on the charts, the free trade agreement, I'm going to only say a couple of things. Uh, First, you know, thanks to all of you. I mean, we wouldn't have these free trade agreements without engagement, both on the part of business and labor. That's a big thing. A couple of things, um, you know, there's a lot of follow-up here. So you see the charts, but there's a lot of follow-up to get this done, and I'll just touch on a few things. Uh, we need to talk to business people. We need to reach out, actually, particularly to the smaller and medium size, because the larger business will understand largely how to take advantage of these opportunities. So a big education program to, to make a reality and a near-term reality the benefits of these agreements, that's number one. I think there'll be more talk about that later yeah. on. At the same time, we have the responsibility, particularly at the Commerce Department, to see to it that the terms, the mandatory terms of compliance with these agreements really are enforced and monitored. So all active trade agreements, we have to see it to it that the private sector, the business people of our country, and the workers, the employees, really get what is promised with these free trade agreements. And that's not an automatic. That takes a lot of follow through. And finally, let me just say, uh, in addition to working with the business community, you know, at the Commerce Department, I am working a lot with the U.S. Trade Representative, Department of State, Agriculture, Treasury, and others, identifying as early as we can any emerging commercial concerns. So, you know, we know that there will be things that arise that we hadn't foreseen. We want your feedback really promptly on that, and we'll work together on those solutions. So I'll stop there, but thanks. Okay. Thank you, John. Chairman Hochberg, did, did you want to add something here? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I will uh, just add yes. Our, uh, we are waiting for our reauthorization to go through. We 
Uh, the President has asked for $140 billion for a, a cap of our portfolio. We're already in the 90s. Uh, our current cap is $100 billion, so uh, we definitely need to get this done if we're, not, if we're going to keep financing exports. Just to uh, round up, we completed our year uh, four weeks ago, I think, like Carol. We both had, we had a record year. Uh, Exxon Bank is up over 100 percent from when President Obama was elected. We did about $33 billion worth of loans and guarantees and insurance, which generates approximately 290,000 jobs, um, and about $6 billion of that, also a record for us, was small business. Um, as uh, Jim mentioned, we, we have a program called Supply Chain Finance, where we uh, indirect exporters are those who are supplying companies like Boeing, Caterpillar, Case to Holland are the first three. Mary and I have talked about whether that could work for Vermeer. Um, also working with Ford to help them do more exports out of the uh, uh, plant in Chicago. And uh, yesterday, just to give an example, I was on the phone with Oshkosh, uh, Charlie Sues, who's the CEO. Um, we're helping them bid on a uh, fire and rescue for Indonesia. And it's not a lot, but it will add, you know, 15 employees for a year to just get this 20-odd million dollar contract. And so, you know, the 290,000 is like a telephone number. You know, 15 employees in Oshkosh, Wisconsin is, is a real number. That's 15 families that have an income and as pick up with jeans that stay in their house, keep their kids in school, and that's just one of many transactions. So, um, uh, our, but our focus now is making sure we get reauthorized, and yeah. reauthorized at the right number. And you've got a lot of people around the table helping us, so we'll keep, we'll Good. Keep My comments are mostly on infrastructure, which we'll talk about later when Secretary LaHood is here, so that's fine. I have four to, to go through. First is veterans trainings programs. Uh, the PEC has recommended that an enhanced focus on veterans training could address the problems that veterans are facing um, as they transition back to civilian workforce while also addressing some serious skill shortages that um, many companies have. The Veterans Employment and Training Services, VETS, has been working to launch new initiatives that assist veterans in finding work as part of a broader White House strategy outlined in the Strengthening Our Military Families report. These steps represent uh, positive progress, but more has to be done, more could be done, more has to be done to ensure that these programs match up with our returning vets. Um, and um, we'll continue to work um, on that effort. And work should also be done to make sure that our veterans are aware of and give them access to necessary STEM training science, technology, engineering, and math training and education so that they are more ready to fill these, these um, posts. I look forward to um, our continuing work on this and um, want to continue to work with the administration to bolster these um, important programs. And I'd like to now turn it over to Secretary Solis to see if she has any comments on this. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited about the opportunity to, uh, you know, be engaged in this effort. It's something that we have a very high priority in our administration and, of course, our agency. One of the things that we created recently was a goal card standard. It's a card that's available to veterans that are leaving uh, the military, and it's distributed through the TAPS program. And what it will do is allow for individuals that qu everyone will qualify as soon as they are are exiting, but before they leave, they'll understand that they'll have a commitment from the Department of Labor for six months of intensive services that they will be able to receive at our one-stop centers. And I think some of you know uh, that we have about 3,000 of these centers, and they're out there, and they'll provide coaching, resume writing, advice, training assistance, and actually give them an availability to get service from other components of our one-stop. So if it's to start a new job or to get other kinds of wraparound services, that will be made available. So that's a goal card standard they'll be available for the six months intensive period. Um, the next thing I'd like to say is that we created also uh, a tool that's called My Next Move for veterans. We've already used some of this information to help dislocated workers and people that are in the 
an employment uh, area now. But now we're, we're actually tailoring it to veterans so that they can then, before they even leave service, can draw down information about what occupations and skill sets are better matched with employers. So we're going an extra mile to do that and it's tailor-made for veterans, something that's very easy to access. And then we're also working with our other sister agencies to create a veterans job bank where over 500,000 uh, listings and postings will be available and we hope to get that up and get more corporations and companies involved. So that's going to be available. Something that I did want to mention that we're doing with Microsoft that's new is that they have identified five uh, areas in the country where they want to actually make investments and help provide training for individuals uh, to be exposed to, you know, IT, to Microsoft and understand how to use that. You'd be surprised how many young vets that are uh, faced with coming back home and haven't had any higher education or training whatsoever. So they are going to make an investment and begin that uh, the coming year. So we're hoping to see that expand. And that's something that's nice that corporations are stepping up to the plate to make that available for, for our veterans. Um, I don't think I have to reiterate how important it is that uh, the younger vets that are coming home post 9-11 are the ones that are faced with anywhere from 12 percent and higher unemployment. And they're coming home literally faced with many challenges. And one initiative also that just to keep in mind is we're expanding our Job Corps programs that are currently available to allow for slots to be made open for them as well. It's a disciplined, uh, very structured uh, environment. It's almost as though you're living on a college campus and in many ways it helps to provide them with that kind of structured discipline that they need. But we certainly would like to see more opportunities available for apprenticeship training and programs to also be a part of their uh, re-entry and reintegration back into the workforce. So I'm excited and, and want to continue to expand and hear about any ideas that you may have, how we can make improvements in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We had an outstanding meeting um, yesterday with Secretary Panetta um, and spoke about this uh, topic in a fair amount of detail. And I'm pleased to say that he is um, as committed um, and as engaged as Secretary Gates was um, in this effort. So we are looking forward to continued progress here and continued good, good progress here. Um, next topic is on services data. Um, data on services exports, as most of you know, we've talked about this before, is um, much more limited um, than the substantial data that we have on government, that the government collects and analyzes on other goods exported. Um, the PEC recommended that the U.S. government improve the quality of export data for the U.S. services sector, including um, through increasing funding to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA, and improvement in data sharing among key agencies like the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics. Progress has been made. Um, the BEA is attempting to reallocate funding within its existing budget to strengthen services data um, collection and analysis. And we also need to thank uh, Senator Wyden and Congresswoman Weikert. Thank you very much both members of the PEC for shepherding this legislation that would permit the data sharing that the PEC recommended. The legislation is a significant step forward. We're a major, Xerox Corporation is a major services provider around the world and the collection of this data is important for our company um, as well. Next steps will in involve increased private sector engagement. Uh, the BEA and others will reach out to companies to see if they can provide relevant services data and to solicit their input on data improvement priorities. The next step will involve further implementation of these actions to begin providing the enhanced data. I'd like to turn it over to Senator, to Congressman Reichert, um, who is here, to comment on it, if you can, please. Uh, thank you, Ursula, and, and uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I've been to all of the, the um, Export Council meetings, uh, haven't missed one yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this effort. Uh, and, I, and I share the frustration that Jean was sharing earlier and the, the uh, sometimes a lack of progress and bipartisanship in, uh, in Congress, not only on the House side but on the, the Senate side. But I would like to, before I comment on the services uh, issue, I would like to say that uh, I, I too uh, uh, share the excitement uh, around the trade agreement success. I think it uh, does show some bipartisan the opportunity and a hopeful attitude that we can make some progress. Uh, even though, uh, as Bill said, uh, it, it wasn't the easiest thing to get done. Uh, some members uh, came uh, dragging and kicking, but uh, we got them there. And a uh, great historical success, I think, in those three trade agreements. Uh, Washington State especially excited about the Korean agreement. 
um, and the opportunities there for aerospace and uh, the services uh, industry. Uh, just uh, to touch briefly on the bipartisanship uh, uh, issue, uh, at a local level, it sometimes works. So I wanted to share this story briefly. Adam Smith and I, the, a Democrat from uh, Washington State, uh, are hosting a jobs fair, which we're calling Hire America, helping identify real employment in America. We have uh, over 75 uh, vendors. These are vendors who have come forward. Boeing is, is one uh, participant who have come forward and said, we are hiring people. So these just aren't businesses showing up to, to be there, but they're actually in the process of hiring people. They have jobs. So we are expecting thousands of people to come to this bipartisan uh, fair, and uh, it's going to be happening uh, next week. So we're excited about that, hope to duplicate that across the country and create some excitement around finding those jobs, but also creating some, uh, some degree of hopefulness for, for those who see Congress, members of Congress, not working together, <laughs> but we can shake hands sometimes. So on the issue of services, um, I think it's really important uh, for me to be here and listen to the dialogue that is a, the exchange here that takes place, the information that you provide us. Uh, the legislation, of course, is, is fashioned after that, uh, after that discussion and after the dialogue and the information that, that you uh, give us. Um, but, uh, at, you know, an old sheriff, uh, hostage negotiator, homicide detective, and SWAT commander, I like to see things get done, Jim. And, uh, and so we are going to push this thing. We're not going to rest until we get it done. That's, that's my commitment to this issue. And I know it's not going to be easy, but with everybody in this room working together, we, we can uh, get this through. And as you, you know, some of the concerns that have been mentioned, um, uh, privacy is, is, is one of those around the services area. But it really is an area where we have a great advantage across this country in making great uh, strides and success in, in, in uh, creating jobs, protecting jobs, and, uh, and I think that the, the uh, comments made around the table today regarding education uh, of the public and, and uh, their maybe lack of knowledge so thus far, anyway, as to our uh, trade agreements and our friendships and partnerships with those countries around the world is really an effort that is sometimes undervalued, underestimated. Uh, it is one that needs to take place to change the, the, the sort of culture in America where trading uh, and doing business with other countries is really a bad thing. We need to convince people it's a good thing. It is a job creator, and uh, it, it, uh, you know, the bottom line is sell American. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. It has not gone unnoticed. It's not going on notice that you have been at every meeting, so thank you for your, <laughs> for your tenacity and your dedication it. and pushing this. Thank you, Congressman Riker. Um, next um, area is on intellectual property rights. Uh, the PEC has made a number of recommendations designed to improve IPR enforcement and strengthen legal standards of IPR protection in foreign markets. Strengthening IPR overseas is clearly a, a critical priority. It is also a long-term effort, one that is um, is made progress, especially given its starting point, uh, the starting point of many of our trading partners. The U.S. government has made good progress in implementing many of the PEC's recommendations in this area, particularly with respect to improving U.S. strategy and coordination across the agencies. Many federal agencies collaborated to assist the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordination, or IPEC, in the formulation of the Joint Strategic Plan on Intellectual Property Enforcement. Work continues to better coordinate the work of IP attaches overseas with embassies and agencies in Washington. Um, we can all agree that strengthening IP overseas will be a long-term effort. The steps that have been taken will strengthen the U.S. coordination and our strategy. And in the next steps will require continued implementation of these strategies to improve IP rights around the world. Um, a long way to go, a good start, and we'll keep focused on, on this area for sure. Um, the last um, area is on business visas, another long-standing issue. And during the PEC's most recent uh, meeting in March of this year, we recommended that the U.S. government address the many serious issues with respect to visa policies and processing that hampers U.S. companies' ability to do business um, globally. As we noted, business visas, visas play a vital role in connecting U.S. companies with suppliers, customers, 
and even uh, potential investors. Progress on these recommendations has been much more limited than in other areas that we'll discuss today. Uh, the Interdepartmental Working Group on Business-Related Visas has addressed business-related visa application problems as they have arisen on a case-by-case on a -case basis. The existence of this working group and their efforts are a positive first step. However, much more needs to be done, um, actually much more needs to be done more rapidly to make a more significant and systemic uh, change in the way that the United States implements and processes business visas. I am hopeful that the government will have the opportunity to make additional progress on this critical priority before our next meeting. And I'd like to, to put the Secretary on the spot a bit and turn it over to Secretary Bryson for his comments. Well, this is a big deal. Uh, we hear a lot about it from businesses, and it's pretty obvious. We can't be a genuine trade country, really open to trade and encouraging of trade, if in the aftermath, for example, of 9-11, kind of restrictions and concerns that arose, we have to overcome those legitimate business travelers have to be able to get here. And as Ursula said, it can't be just on a one at a time basis. So we're putting a big priority on it. Uh, obviously, if these people can't get here, they can't buy our goods, they can't invest in our economy, they can't spin off and go into our tourist attractions and so on. I think special credit right now is actually due to Secretary of State Clinton and the Department of State. They're really moving on this. Of course, we've talked with them a lot because this ties so much into the things that we at the Commerce Department need to do, but I'm really delighted by the steps that are actually being taken now, for example, notably most recently in a considerable movement of people in the visa areas for Brazil and for China. There's a lot yet to be done, however. Thank you, Secretary. I'd like to turn it over to um, Scott Davis so that he can comment on trade facilitation and the single window and benchmarking. Thanks, Ursula. You know, many countries around the globe have shown great export growth you know, over the last decade. So as a group, we decided to ask the administration, the Commerce Department, to go out and benchmark uh, several of these countries. Per the recommendation, the Department of Commerce conducted a comprehensive study of seven top exporting countries, including Canada, Germany, UK, India, Australia, Sweden, and Brazil. Now, we, we have not yet, the, the results are being compiled. We have not seen the results as of yet, but I'm expecting that, that quite soon. In conjunction with this, uh, the Commerce Department also benchmarked uh, several websites of, of, of foreign countries, UK, Canada, and Australia. And some of those good websites, I think, helped us revamp the export.gov website, which I had a chance to look at last week and was quite impressed. So if any of you get a chance to look at the website, export.gov, it's a real a great tool for small and medium-sized enterprises to get into the exporting business. So take a look. I'm not sure if anybody in the Commerce Department's had a sneak peek at the, at the compilations yet. They do comment. Where do you comment? Any comments on benchmarking? Well, just, just real quickly, um, yeah, there's been a kind of initial look at, at a little bit of the findings. I'll just pick out one thing that quite struck our people, and that is a number of countries use their local chambers of commerce. We call it the local chamber of commerce. And at those local chambers of commerce, they are taking the initiative in their immediate communities to train young people for the jobs that are most attractive and available. So they're catching it early. They're doing it in ways that doesn't cost the local people, those that can't perhaps afford it, to have this extraordinary kind of training. And so that struck us. I, we want to get this fully done. We will get it done quickly, and we'll get the reports back to you as soon as we can. Thank you. Thanks very much. Is, uh, is Dick Freeman here? Yeah, Dick, there you are. Uh, report on uh, tourism, travel, a big deal. So uh, as, is this on? Uh, yeah, it's on. One of the first letters that we wrote was about tourism and travel. Um, I think there's been some, some, uh, some substantial progress that's good progress on this issue. Uh, let me just quickly tell you, hotel occupancy in the United States just overall is up about 4% to 60%. Uh, revenue is actually up about 8%. But in the luxury and, uh, and upscale stuff, it's up 8 to 10 percent, which is a very, very healthy number because most of the foreigners stay in upper scale properties. Um, uh, we've made, uh, if we were able to get back to our traditional share of the, of the, of the world market, it'd be a, 
almost uh, 1.3 million jobs and 8, 8 to 10, 800 to 900 billion dollars in revenue. And I th my own view is that this could be done in a couple years. This is not something that's, this is a relatively easy thing given the complexities of lots of other things that we work on. Um, we want to, I want to report that the brand USA uh, promotion has just launched itself in the last week or two at the World Travel Mart. That's the Travel Promotion Act. We now have money to advertise this country. 65% of the people who come to the United States come on from visa waived countries. We've got to add more countries to the visa waived program. The people are working on that. In my view, not quite fast enough, but there's potential to add Taiwan, Poland, Chile, a few other countries to the visa waived program, which would be very helpful. In China, there has been enormous, in China, India, and Brazil, there's been enormous progress. Under Secretary uh, Tom Nides has done a fabulous job, in my view. Uh, in China, and uh, in China, the wait times have gone down from 120 days to 20 days, uh, it plus a 50 percent increase in the number. Uh, so that the Chinese, the Chinese visas have gone from 500,000 in 2009 up to a million two this year. Very, very substantial progress, and those people spend money. India, wait times for visas down to 20 days. Brazil is still a bad situation, but it's dropped in half from 145 to like 80 or something days. Um, the way they've done this is a model, I think, because they make money in the State Department on visas. The way, the way they've done it is pretty simple. They add more windows, they add more shifts, they add more people, and they process more. And those people come, and they want to come. Um, I just would say one other thing. Um, you know, th this is a big deal, as you said, Mr. Chairman. You know, in, um, in the um, uh, long-haul travel business, uh, China, you know, China's travel over the last 10 years up 120, out outbound travel from China, 126 percent. India, 124 percent. We're 2 percent. Yeah. So we've just lost a, uh, a huge um, a window, and we can, we can pick it up, I think, easily. Um, the, uh, I just want to also say that there are seven legislative proposals in Congress. Uh, sir, uh, um, Senator Klobuchar has one. There's a, quite a number. So if we push those things, this is a really resolvable issue. If we get homeland security, commerce, and state to work together. Uh, but I think, I think there has been progress, and I think there is a sort of focus on this, and I think it's pretty good news. Thanks for your report, Dick. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Gene, do you have a do you have a comment on SME, and maybe uh, Administrator Mills could comment afterwards. I do. Um, thank you, and welcome aboard again, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, first, let me say thanks to Secretary uh, Solis for hosting the SME uh, at her office uh, a few months back. Also had um, meetings with uh, Administrator Mills, and they hosted us in terms of uh, describing all the programs that were available to the uh, community, and uh, so. Here, here with the SME committee, what we've done so far, we've held uh, five roundtables across the country and uh, in the most uh, high export cities. And uh, we, we identified the challenges, one uh, being uh, education, the lack of education, I should say, about these uh, different programs. The other is always the, the issue of uh, lack of access to capital, the uh, cost burdens as relates to uh, regulatory <laughs> issues and misconceptions about uh, FTAs. Uh, this basically re re resulted in the recommendations to begin what we call the regional export initiatives. And the purpose of that is to coalesce the, uh, the local business and private sectors in order and communities and universities to uh, focus on minorities in those communities on the ground to do, do to actually to do the outreach as opposed to having the SBA and uh, the Department of Commerce to do that. Uh, Brookings has taken the lead on promoting another issue, which is called the Metro uh, Export Initiatives, and uh, they've done that in four cities. I believe that um, even though we're in a tight budget environment, I believe that the Department of Commerce ran out of uh, green ink when we got down to the uh, looking at the chart here because uh, they have it yellow. And I think if you looked at the uh, <laughs> uh, SME Trade Capacity Export Assistance, you will see that. The SBA has been very, very busy uh, promoting their program. So, uh, Mike, uh, if you ran out of ink, uh, let us know. We'll get you some green the next time. Um, but those are very, very important uh, issues that uh, they put out there. But we like to say that um, with the STEP program, we believe that the next round of STEP funding 
should go beyond just awarding the, um, the money to the states, but get it down into the metros and the regions so they can have an, uh, a situation where they can compete and get the uh, boots on the ground from the minority community. I, uh, and lastly, um, I had a meeting with, uh, I've had two meetings with Secretary LaHood, and um, I made some recommendations to him that, and he agreed with. Uh, basically, we're talking about just simple changes in DOT policies that will create substantial subcontracting opportunities for small businesses, thus creating a substantial number of jobs. So we're looking forward to him implementing those procedures in the very near future, and we certainly believe that uh, in our next meeting, we will have some substantial uh, information to report. Thank you. Yes, yeah, good. <laughs> when you want me to. <laughs> yeah, but they're looking forward to it. Thank you very much. And I want to add my thanks uh, to all of you for the passage of the free trade agreements and to Ron Cook, uh, Ron, Ron Kirk. Um, you know, this, uh, as I travel all around the country, I meet small businesses. I was in Miami and I met a small business who was immediately going to implement on the Columbia free trade agreement that he already exports uh, environmentally safe cleaning products to Latin America. He's a Hispanic-owned business. And this is just, you know, opening up another market, giving him a level playing field. It's particularly true also in Korea. And it's true in Korea because we're going to be able to have small businesses sell into the Korean government procurement operations, which is actually a huge uh, opportunity. Uh, John, you mentioned um, capital. So we are highly focused on capital. As Fred said, we had a record year in SBA loan guarantees, $30 billion, the biggest year ever in SBA history. And exports, um, uh, loans to exporters was up 40 percent. So we have um, made an enormous effort, both with new products and with our current outreach, to educate small businesses that these are demand opportunities for them. And this will be an ongoing effort for quite some time because the potential is, is absolutely huge. One of the things that um, we are doing is looking at businesses in export supply chains. And with Fred's product, we've just introduced a product called CapLines. It's a revision of a current product. Under the President's theme of um, let's not wait, let's see what we can do in our current authority, let's take a current product, let's take the paperwork from this much down to this much, and um, this is an asset-based loan. If any of you have ever had one, you know there can be a lot of paperwork. And now this is available for your supply chain to take that next order that you want to put down to them to either export directly to your plant overseas or to export uh, or, or to give it to you so that you can export more effectively. I want to introduce Dario Gomez, who's here, who's the head, our new head of uh, Small Business International Trade. The reason that this is so important is in the Small Business Jobs Act, which was passed a year ago, we were asked to elevate our trade activities. And we were very happy to do that and to be given the funding of $60 million for STEP grants. And what uh, Dario oversees, among all of our other efforts, is a new program where this year we just awarded 47 states money to do um, what all of you who have been out in the small business world know is important, to have a focused effort at the state level on helping small businesses get the expertise, get the capital, get the business opportunities to export. And we did it as a competition, which all of you will appreciate. And that really upped the stakes. And actually, I'm surprised the intention was to give some money to as many folks as possible, particularly the small states who export. And that was written in the legislation. We were able to do that, so uh, 47 states and um, three territories. We are about to start a next round of these. And one of the great suggestions we've had is to work with mayors as well as states because sometimes the mayors are driving even more these small business-centered mm -hmm. export activities, mm -hmm. and they need to be link leveraged and aligned with all of the community-based lending, all of the skill building that we're working very hard uh, with Secretary Solis on. Um, 
in order to make sure that we can uh, optimize the opportunity set for these small businesses. It's truly a place where there is potential, as Jean urged us, to uh, augment the American, uh, the, the U.S.-based growth rate. Finally, I just want to make one comment about the veterans program. Um, in conjunction with uh, the military and um, uh, with Secretary Solis, we are working very hard on veteran entrepreneurship. So not just create jobs for veterans, but have j veterans create businesses, and those businesses create jobs. And many of them come here with, back with overseas experience, with ideas. Um, I will say that I spent Veterans Day in a UPS store with a veteran business owner of a franchise, and the International Franchise Association has joined with the First Lady in making it easier for veterans, in fact, less costly. At a, uh, they pay a discounted veteran uh, franchise fee. And uh, we stood up in one of uh, uh, those great stores and were able to show how um, a veteran can start a business and um, then hire more people, including more veterans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very near and dear to my heart. I'll make this um, quick. This has been a, an ongoing subject. This letter recommends that the administration work with our trading partners to negotiate an updated and expanded information technology um, agreement. It was signed in, originally in 1996. The ITA eliminated tariffs on the majority of the information technology products uh, to most major export markets around the world. Unfortunately or fortunately, technology moves on, and uh, the agreement hasn't moved as quickly along to match the technology moves, um, and it has not been updated for that since that time. Um, it's one of the most successful um, agreements that we have, uh, that the U.S. has, um, and um, we need to actually update it. So industry studies indicate that an expanded ITA, both expanded in type of products but also in markets that it impacts, would um, impact us of a, over $122 billion in trade. Mm. Yeah, it's big. In addition to expanded product coverage, as I said, um, we need to expand country, country um, participation as well, Mexico and Brazil are the two places that we are focused on. And we are sure that um, in my industry alone, um, we, if we could balance the, the field a little bit, we'll be able to increase our trade in those, in those um, our competitiveness and our trade in those two marketplaces. I appreciate the support that the administration has already shown for this initiative. They just had a meeting at APEC this weekend and made some good progress um, there. And in, week, in recent weeks, the European Union supported the idea of moving these negotiations forward um, at the WTO separately and outside of the context of this broader Do Doha round that's coming up. Expanding the ITA is the kind of short-term and targeted initiative that we need to provide an immediate and substantial boost to the U.S. exports and jobs, and so ensuring an open access um, of all of our products, all types of information technology products to all of the markets is something that um, will drive exports and jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, well explained. Uh, uh, any discussion or objections? Seems like a pretty straightforward one. So without objection, the letter is adopted by the Council. Uh, second is a letter on expanding trade with the developing democracies in the Middle East and North Africa. And Andrew Liveris will discuss it. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Middle East, North Africa, Arab Spring, and the U.S. political presence and U.S. military presence, we all read about. The U.S. commercial presence is something that, uh, frankly, we needed to pay attention to. So this letter addresses that and does a very fine job. And I don't know whether you're aware of some of the statistics, but our exports to the Middle East have grown 2.5 times faster than actually our exports to the rest of the world. So we are already, as a country, uh, it represents our fourth largest export market. So for all the right reasons, uh, this letter addresses why we've got to ramp up 
our commercial engagement. And my own company with a $20 billion investment in Saudi Arabia, I can tell you the Middle Easterners and North Africans, uh, Jeff Immelt led a delegation to uh, Tunisia and Egypt right after the fall of those two regimes. They want American products and American engagement. They are still on a commercial basis our friends. And so if you look at what we've recommended here, we see some tangible ways we can up uh, the ante here and help them reform their systems. Uh, firstly, uh, we have focused in on three areas, water, alternative energy, and infrastructure. And the letter basically talks about building domestic support for necessary reforms within their systems so that we can see improvements in the trade agenda, ultimately leading to free trade agreements. So one, promoting national infrastructure projects and helping them with our technologies, opening up uh, areas such as water supply, such as infrastructure around airports and, and a whole lot of other areas that we cover, and even green cities helping them get a jump start on the rebuild and using most efficient American technologies to get the green um, uh, footprint in place. Technology transfer with IP support, which of course is a very big part of protecting our American enterprise and intellectual property. And third, regional integration efforts. efforts. And here, um, Mr. Secretary, you know, the uh, Commerce Department inside U.S. embassies, We've had the Secretary of State here saying, you know, they are the first American business engagement. I know, I know you think that way, and we'll get around to that on another topic we'll get on to later in this agenda. But, but harmonization of standards, uh, removal of non-tariff tariff barriers, which, you know, we see a plenty, uh, really getting them up to scratch on removal of subsidies and why that's good for their population, and then, of course, the whole market access uh, topic. That's all in this letter. I've given you as quick a summary as I can, as fast as I can, but uh, I'm, that's the letter, Mr. Chairman. An unusually brief summary for you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I am so conscious of your time management <laughs> skills, Jim. Yeah, I am so, I'm actually, you got me worried now, so. <laughs> yeah, I can tell I'm having a real impact. Jim, Jim. Uh, Listen, this really is an incredibly important topic. And, and does Ambassador Kirk want to comment? Yeah, why, why don't you do that? And then I'll come back. I, I will do my best to, to match Andrew's brevity <laughs> um, in the sense that the letter, I, we think, very much amplifies the direction that the president sort of an ambition laid out for this region and the speech he made back in May. Um, just to give you some comfort, I think you know we have trade agreements with Bahrain, Oman, Jordan, Israel, Morocco. So obviously we're focusing on the rest of the region. Um, Ambassador Sapiro has been working also very closely, frankly, with our colleagues in the European Union, recognizing this could be an area we could have some great synergies. We have some capacity constraints in the region right now. Uh, a lot of these governments are reconstituting, trying to decide, but we just had a team over recently and met with Egypt and others. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of you in that we actually published a notice in the Federal Register back in September, asking the public for sort of comments on a broad strategy uh, for what we call our MENA Trade and Investment Partnership. And we got pretty good responses to that, and we'll be looking at everything from, you know, something similar to what we're doing, a Trans-Pacific Partnership, looking at what we can do in a regional model rather than trying to go in country but country. But I'll be honest, we're probably two or three steps away from an FTAs for some of these economies just because they aren't But there is still a lot we can do in that region. So, uh, I mean, your, your letter, for the most part, I think, tracks and is pretty parallel uh, to the engagement that we've got going on. Uh, terrific. I mean, this really is an incredibly important topic. These fledgling democracies in that part of the world, very important to engage constructively. So. Uh, We'll keep working with you. Uh, any other discussion? Objection? Without objection, the letter is adopted. Third, uh, a letter on workforce readiness will be explained by, by Pat. Pat Thank you. I will uh, compete for brevity as well. Uh, <laughs> this is a topic that our pre-meetings have addressed in many ways, whether we met with Secretary Panetta yesterday at uh, Senator Stabenow's reception on agriculture last night at our breakfast this morning, with the secretary, so it's a very important subject uh, to a lot of us. I'm sorry that our subcommittee chair, Bill Height, uh, the general president for the uh, United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters, couldn't be with us today to present it. I did speak with him yesterday, and he sends his regards to everyone. Uh, the UAPP has worked hard and conscientiously with uh, many of us in industry to address what we think are important issues. The letter and details are here with 
actually a very good appendix as well, uh, which I'm sure you all read. I'll just summarize the four important areas. Upgrading our basic education uh, and expand high skills training. Uh, putting training, particularly our best training for veterans to better equip them for uh, today and tomorrow's economy. Community colleges, retooling them for uh, and a refocus because a very important resource and we think it can be a very important part of uh, workforce readiness. And then as we've all seen, the area of STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math skills all needing to be upgraded. Uh, I think many of my colleagues around the table also wanted to comment specifically on a, on a few of these items, so that summarizes the that, letter. That, that's great. I, I think the uh, uh, just one little addition, and I think Mary wanted to comment, so I wanted to turn to her in just a second. The, um, in our discussion with Secretary Panetta yesterday, a lot of companies are approaching this in different ways. You know, Boeing's approaching it one way, Mary's approaching it another, some very innovative stuff. A best practices look around, just around the peck might supplement some mm -hmm. of the stuff, and so we'll, we'll keep pushing right. on that. Mary, did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this, this issue is, is near and dear to my heart. I'm a former teacher and education has always been very important to me. Um, and because right now our, in our industry, we are having growth and have opportunities to hire people. And finding that it's one of our biggest challenges is being able to find the skilled workforce. So um, I'd just like to comment on two of the recommendations in particular. One is the importance uh, that we need to continually keep in front of everyone of the high school um, education and graduation. And one of the things that we've done, and I've, I've mentioned this to a few people, that, that is, is something is just, I think we all have to be thinking futuristic. And um, we do an internship for teachers in the summer for high school, and we're, we're looking about even putting it down to junior high teachers of a 70 mile radius of our, of our major uh, manufacturing plants. And um, try to encourage teachers with a paid internship, and they can also receive credit for that three weeks, to come in and understand what are the kinds of jobs that we have in our companies. And what's interesting is after they spend three weeks, and one week is on a Kaizen, so they're on a lean continuous improvement event, and they're of course fantastic contributors to those sorts of events. They, they, I, almost every time, and we've done this for five years, I hear them say, well, this is very interesting. I never realized there were so many good jobs in manufacturing. In fact, many of them say, I thought manufacturing was leaving this country, which is one of those myths we have to continually dispel. And um, so that, I think it's just, again, an example that we as private sector need to collaborate continually with our schools because next to parents, teachers have a huge influence on young people. And so to have them uh, understand the importance of the kinds of jobs we have in our communities and, and also the skills that people need, whether it's the basic math skills, definitely communication, being able to work in a team, all those sorts of things, as well as the soft skills of as showing up every day and, and finishing jobs. Um, and then I'd also like to just mention that on the readiness programs and working collaboratively with community colleges, uh, recommendation four, um, this is a, a really huge one. And again, it's, it's maybe, as to your point about the best practices and people doing different things, there are a lot of different groups doing some fantastic things to skill up the workforce. And uh, the NAM has been involved in something called um, workforce skill certification. And actually, the president um, uh, endorsed it last summer at a, a meeting at Northern uh, Virginia uh, Community College. And it really is working with community colleges and companies and, and uh, various other organizations to, um, to, to have skills certification for 500,000 uh, employees by in, in the next five years. And I think that's actually a low number to be able to go and work very successfully in manufacturing jobs. And so for us, I know right now we have trained um, over 80 welders this year. And we are working with uh, the community colleges and the American Welding Association to continue to improve our training programs and the skill certification. So I, I just believe that there's um, a lot of opportunity for, for people in our country and military included, although many military people come with fantastic skills to start with. It's just getting the right match. And what's very frustrating, I think, for most of us is we see the 9% unemployment rate and we're looking for people. 
And it's that dilemma of fitting, maybe we're not in the right places, you know, it's, it's we're different locales, but also just matching the people up and willing to do the training, doing the training to get people to have great jobs, because there are good jobs available in this country, we just got to get the match. And uh, I think we can do that, and when we do, we'll just all be stronger. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Terrific. Uh, Ursula, did you have a comment on STEM? This is my, as most of you know, my um, passion, um, so much so that um, I serve on the board of an organization um, started by, at the behest of the president, called Change the Equation, and it's all about improving um, education in science, technology, engineering, and math at the high school and earlier levels. Um, I agree with you, Mary. This is uh, it's a kind of a frustrating place to be where many of us need employees um, but can't really always find them um, in the right, some of it is location-based, but a lot of it is skill-based. Uh, this is an area that all of us around the table are engaged in in different ways. Everyone, every CEO around this table is engaged somehow or the other, in either change the equation or in an organization like it. Um, and it's just one that, it's going to take a little bit of time, but we have to keep focused on and keep diligent about. And this idea of engaging um, two-year colleges, community colleges, is very, very important. It's a resource that we lost sight of that can help us add value and uh, change the equation has just gotten engaged with community colleges as well to make sure that we can actually bridge this gap that we have. So I agree, I agree totally. Thank you, Ursula. Better. Gene, did you want to weigh in? Uh, just, just briefly yeah. on uh, the second challenge here that we have. Um, you're absolutely right, the community colleges where a lot of this should start. Uh, basically, when we talk about bolstering the uh, STEM skill and education and training, I think the, uh, the community colleges, they're the ones that are uniquely um, suited to facilitate those sort of uh, dialogues and convene the local educational partners, employers, and labor organizations to identify the skill sets needed to prepare uh, locally for the 21st century. The recommendation um, to boost this workforce readiness program at community colleges should utilize what we believe are the following. Um, NAM, Endorsed Manufacturing Skills Certification System. The second is the uh, fast tracking of the Right Skills Now initiative that will target specific skill gaps and provide accelerated training to directly fill these gaps. And third is the uh, public-private partnerships to create degree programs, which are essential to support economic development efforts. We believe that uh, this should be a uh, high priority for the administration and, the, and these different departments. Thank you, Jean. D did you have a comment, Stephanie? Did you want to say something? Yeah, I think much of what I was going to say has already been covered, so I'll, I'll just be brief in, first of all, congratulating Pat and, and the team on what I think is one of the strongest letters on workforce readiness um, that I've seen. Uh, and just to reinforce the engagement that I believe corporations can have with junior colleges and local community colleges in the skill building, um, in, including the donation of, of state-of-the-art equipment that um, vocational training can take place on. I think this is a big opportunity for us. We're seeing that, uh, as I said yesterday at Secretary Panetta's discussion, we're, being a we're able to marry that with um, a local veterans retraining program to get them into that vocational uh, training setting. So I, I just congratulate uh, the team on this letter with strong, strong support. Thank you, Stephanie. Your support's important, too. Andrew, did you want to say something, or oh, is it all been coming? Okay. Any of the, yes, Madam Secretary. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I, I just want to say that uh, I'm really impressed with the, the letter and concur with so much of what has been said already and look forward to continuing to find out how we can better improve our systems to make sure that everyone does get a, a credential. Because in many cases, the dislocated workers that, that uh, Gene Sperling spoke about earlier, we have a lot of folks out there that just c may have only completed a, a secondary education. They've been committed working in, in manufacturing for 20 years, yet they don't have a 
qualified credential that can give them that entree into a business. So we're looking at other tools that are out there right now and hopeful that we can get something on the ground. But overall, I concur with much of what you're doing. We're doing many things now at the Department of Labor, working with community colleges and the manufacturers, and really uh, want to improve upon those relationships, including apprenticeship programs. As you know, many of those that have functioned very well are uh, public-private partnerships. They're fully run by, I would say, uh, mostly management, and they are terrific models to be able to facilitate and get uh, our veterans and dislocated workers back into the system with highly qualified credentials. So I just want to uh, echo everything that's been said and, and really congratulate the team on, on your effort. Thank you. Thank and, you. And your support is really important. Appreciate that. And John, did you want to say something? Yeah, super fast, Jim. Uh, and I love the fact that virtually everybody here wants to say something about this most important subject. And yes, we've done a lot, but somehow we have a heck of a lot of people that are not finding jobs. And there are multiple reasons for that, but some of it is the fit, some of it is the preparedness, all those things. I want to touch on two things. One is by chance at a younger age, I lived in Germany for a time. And the culture with respect to vocational training there is just so fundamentally different. And they've been enormously successful as a consequence because there, there's not a sense that somehow if you don't do a full university program, you don't feel a little out of it. In fact, you take pride, and your family takes pride, and substantially equal pride to the traditional university education. And I think there's a lot to learn there, and that's much observed. The second thing that I want to pick up on, and Jim, I thought your point about this group looking at best practices is a really good idea. I want to raise one. This is more in the form of a question, but it's an experience. So I've recruited a friend, just a wonderful friend of mine, a guy that I'd gone to college with and so on, who's been in the manufacturing field for you know, the last 40 years in various ways. And he's been very successful, and I won't go through all that. But he decided he feels so strongly about this that about a decade ago, a little more than that, he decided he was going to create his own vocational education program for the fields. And these are small and medium-sized manufacturing. That's been his field. Uh, and he did it for nine years. And he had the financial capacity to say, well, I'm just going to take it on. But what he ran into by way of local, state, and local taxation, local and state permitting, just unbelievable. So when he tells this story, you say to yourself, you know, companies wonderfully are doing the training, community colleges are doing the training, but I wonder how targeted that is and how precisely that fits where the jobs are. So, and the best practices, I'd love to see this group okay. begin to tack, get at some of these possibly regulatory issues, I don't know what they are, like taxation that. issues, because there's some things that aren't happening here. Okay, we'll take that on as a challenge. Appreciate your comments, John. Are, th are there any other, any other comments? Okay, without objection, we shall adopt, <laughs> adopt the letter. Um, uh, the last, but certainly not least, Raul could not be here with us today. He had a, he had a medical issue, so let me attempt to summarize the letter from uh, Pexia. Th this is um, uh, the fourth letter, and it urges the administration to continue and complete its review of the two export control regimes, some of which we've already talked about. Move to a single IT system, which I think is probably the most important part of the, of the whole recommendation. Conduct outreach and consider a trusted exporter program, which is detailed in the letter. Implementing these ideas will make our system effective, efficient, and easier for companies to understand and comply with, while importantly protecting national security, which, which I always thought was uh, the, the, uh, this recommendation originally coming out of the Defense Department just was a point of reassurance for all of us as we march through this particular uh, initiative. So, uh, John, do you have any comments on this one? It's, yeah, just it's quickly. a relatively big deal for the business community. Yeah, just, you know. this is not on that, though. I think it's important, but on yeah. this, how do we move more of the products that we have in our country into a category in which we can make them expo export products? And so that's part of the uh, Department of Commerce's responsibility on these so-called dual-use products. 
products that have some military and security applications, but right now have been much, much too much lodged together with counterparts of those products that are entirely commercial products that we ought to make available to exporters and sell to the rest of the world. And so I just wanted to report on that. The administration, we are working on this on a category, category, category by category basis. There are proposed revisions to what's called the U.S. munitions list and the commerce control list. And the effect of that will transfer tens of thousands of truly small, insignificant military parts for their commercial applications around the world. Terrific. Any other comments on this particular one, Mike? Yes, just to add to that, uh, and as the Secretary said, we are going category by category. It's painstaking work, and uh, we appreciate the input that the private sector has had. We have our newly confirmed uh, Undersecretary, uh, Eric Hirshhorn here, who's running a good, a good part of this effort. But I'll give you two examples. Uh, we did a category that was about uh, uh, vehicles. It had 12,000 items on it on the U.S. munitions list. We moved 11,000 over to the commerce control list, which will make it more uh, susceptible to more flexible licensing rules. Some of those things will now be able to be exported without a license altogether uh, around the world. And just recently, I guess last Monday, we published uh, the category that had to do with aerospace, which might be of interest to some in the room, um, where 100,000 items were moved off of the U.S. munitions list to the, to the CCL and will now be eligible for export. Our gating issue here, the next obstacle we have, uh, is that by tradition, we notify Congress when we move an item from one list yep. to the other. Uh, and I'm glad Congressman Reichert is here. The, uh, in the past, it has taken an average of uh, over 200 days to move a single item. We are in the process of moving hundreds of thousands of items from one list to the other, and we need to come up with a new process with Congress so that each item doesn't take uh, 200 days to, to move. But uh, our hope is that by the end of this year, we're, we're through about half of the licensing items and we finish the rest of it next year. And you'll see, I think, a fundamentally different export control system, as you said, consistent with our national security needs, but which will also help our exports. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. A big deal. Any, any other comments? Okay, so uh, if no more discussion without objection, we will adopt, adopt that letter. Mike, while you're while you're geared up, uh, you know, there's maybe we could put all three subjects of yours together. Maybe a quick report on G20, APEC, as well as uh, uh, in your role as, as the chief economic advisor of the president. Uh, uh, we would appreciate uh, national security, the National uh, Security Council, I'm sorry. We really appreciate the opportunity to hear directly from you about the follow up efforts that have taken since our Blair House meeting that most many of us in the room were part of. Yeah, it'd be great. Well, let me, let me start with that and, and thank uh, uh, everyone around the room, and particularly uh, Andy Liveris and his team and the subcommittee for the work on this. Uh, as you recall, we, we launched an effort there to first identify our priority markets around the world, uh, both <coughs> countries and sectors, and then the specific obstacles to U.S. exports. Uh, in each of those areas and the major policy initiatives that could be pursued to remove those obstacles. And we did it consciously very much in a public-private partnership. We came up with our draft ideas about this. We shared it with the subcommittee. We got a lot of very good input and from uh, companies in each of the relevant sectors and, and companies that operate in many of the target countries. And I think we now have uh, we now have sort of a blueprint for how to go out these obstacles from our perspective and from the private sector's perspectives in a, in a meaningful way, and that will help inform our policy processes here. We've done about a dozen countries and a dozen major sectors. It probably covers about 80 percent of our, of our targeted uh, trade, and we will continue to update this and look forward to your continued input, but this should feed into when the president goes to Brazil and we pull out the Brazil page and say, here are the three major obstacles that we've identified that could really uh, increase U.S. exports and we'll have that capability to, uh, to know that we're standing with the private sector and ensuring that we're focusing on the right thing. So again, thank you to the subcommittee and the staff for all their work to put into it. Henry, do you want to weigh in here? Yeah, I, I'd love to and um, maybe not as brief as last time, uh, <laughs> but 
But I do think I want to bow You've back. You've done an enormous amount of work on this. Yeah, we, we want to, we all collectively want to bow back to the administration. I think Gene Sperling said it very well earlier, and Secretary Daly, and now from Mike and the um, USTR as well, Mr. Kirk. We, um, we are working as a public-private uh, partnership in this forum like I think aspirationally we should all want to work, and trade <coughs> is in everyone's best interest, and trade strategies are now taking hold, and not only have we got the Declaration of Success on the three that were signed, but now with the great work that's being done by this collective body, of course with the administration representing us in key forums, we're starting to see country-based, sector-based trade strategies now as really uh, one one page <laughs> strategies that can be now used by all of us collectively, the business world, to help our employees understand why trade is good for them and why it means jobs, and, and that's something that I know many of us take to heart. But certainly putting all that together so that we can, we can really look as a country to export the best trade systems in the world, values and standards. So there are three or four things, thematics, that we are all working on, and I'll try and go through them relatively quickly, but I think these are very important. And there's others in the room who are going to pile on, Jim, if, if you don't mind. So theme number one, repurpose trade policy to target emerging export markets and really create U.S. jobs by so doing. I talked about Middle East, North Africa, but Asia. I mean, everywhere in the world, this is a massive opportunity for the United States. And there are three aspects of that that, are, that matter. I've mentioned them in the MENA uh, conversation. Non-tariff tariff barriers. And Jim, you and I and others know about China's indigenous innovation, and we, we know, and Secretary Bryson, you've already made reference to your two interactions with the Chinese already as an example of, you know, where they are in terms of their script and their, and their hymn sheet. And, you know, we have to be appropriate, uh, obviously professional. We have to be statesmanlike, but at the same time, we can't allow cheating. <laughs> and so, I mean, to say it, so it's said very aggressively. And I think this is a very important sta statement. So government procurement, especially in the emerging sectors, and how we absolutely totally don't allow this, you have to make it here and invent it here, local, you know, we can't go the other way and say, make it in America means buy American, so we don't do that. But at the same time, other countries do. So we have to work on that in our strategies. Trade policies, the FTAs, I think uh, USTR has already talked about that, and standards. Uh, there's no question we have the best standards in the world in terms of how we protect our workers, how we go ahead and sell our products, uh, the feedback back from our products back into our system on <clears throat> making sure we, we, we absolutely totally comply with environmental health and safety standards. These are all necessary things that we include in trade policy to help everyone, rising tide, lift all boats. So that whole thematic around repurposing uh, trade policy around those three sub-points is very key. The second theme I mentioned already as well, but just to reinforce, and that is our embassies and U.S. commercial diplomacy. And I'm so excited, Secretary Bryson, with uh, what you and, and you've already said, uh, the deployments around the world, Secretary of State's referenced them in these meetings, are, are so key that we have a partnership approach with American business, small, medium, and large, so that the many thousands of American businesses that don't export to more than one country that I heard earlier today do, in fact, get the second country and the third country, and our embassies play a very active role. So there's a whole thematic around that. Export financing and Chairman Hochberg's great work and Administrator Mills and all the things we're doing on the financing side to facilitate what is the blood of trade, which is the lifeblood of trade, which is finance. That's the third thematic. And the fourth, which is maybe the most important of them all, and that is connecting domestic policy, job creation, and exports emphatically in everything we say and do. And that American competitiveness and development in America, economic development, ties in directly to job creation in America, and it relates to exports. And I think those are the four thematics uh, that lays out a pretty ambitious uh, set of agendas that we are keep working on in this subcommittee and this, this conversation. Mike Froman and others are working very much with us as in this subcommittee, and we're very excited by that. But I've got some others who want to make some comments. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, do you want me to direct it, or would you? Sure, why don't you direct it? So, Alan, I think you're, you're up first. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I would just like to uh, point out one thing in a little bit more detail that Andrew has talked about. And, uh, you know, Ford, as you know, is uh, expanding everywhere around the world. They love, they love the Ford brand. They love it. Uh, it's associated with the United States uh, ingenuity and technology. And in all my years, I have never seen such working together between Commerce and Treasury, the State Department, and especially the USTR, 
on work in the common issues, the intersections are allowing us to do this. And it's almost like a, the all-time public-private partnership in each of these countries. Yes. And just giving you one example that, uh, um, this, that Ambassador Kirk and I have talked about frequently over the last uh, few years on the free trade agreements, now the TPP, just the awareness of the non-tariff non barriers especially starting with uh, currency discipline, just for an example, that there's one that crosses three or four different departments, and the fact that we are working it together now and figuring out different ways to get solutions to these uh, is absolutely letting us uh, accelerate our expansion. So I just want to share with you that um, your goal and your stated goal of working together on integrated policies and doing it right there in every country around the world is really paying off, and I just encourage you to keep doing that. Terrific, Alan. Um, I think Stephanie wants to add something. Great. Jim, thanks. Uh, yes, thank you, Andrew. Um, I know one component of looking at some of the, the market opportunities um, through this program is renewable energy and energy efficiency, and I strongly applaud that. Um, I think there's some great recommendations in terms of how we can position ourselves uh, better to compete uh, in terms of exporting, uh, whether that be, uh, you know, standards, whether that be encouraging um, the renewable energy of uh, top prospects and things like that. Uh, but the biggest thing we can do for renewable energy is to create the industrial manufacturing base for that here in the United States. And this gets at Andrew's point in terms of the internal and external marriage coming together. And that's a big, big deal. Um, we we need a, an overarching energy policy. We need um, a look at standards and codes and permitting, and we need to create the domestic demand for this renewable energy and energy efficiency that allows us to grow our manufacturing capabilities so we actually have something to export globally. Uh, so these two have to be brought together, otherwise we're trying to push a, a wet noodle up a hill uh, because we're not going to have anything to export. Uh, and that is the big challenge that I see in renewables. Okay. Uh, Jim, when you and Oslo maybe want to yep. add anything to no, this? No, I think, are so you good? Okay. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Mike, do you have a, a quick comment on, on G20 APEC report to the group? Sure. Uh, just on G20, uh, I think it was a, uh, an important meeting. Obviously, the focus was on the Eurozone crisis, but there was other work that got done there uh, uh, through the finance channel. We, I think, got countries to agree to a growth and jobs uh, strategy with countries agreeing to specific items that they would take on to spur growth uh, in the short run, um, uh, including China agreeing to greater, to be determined to be greater, flex more flexibility in exchange rate. Um, and so these are these incremental processes that we, uh, that we undergo here. And with regard to Doha, which I know has been a, of concern uh, to this group, I think for the first time, the G20, there was a recognition that we were not going to achieve an agreement in Doha on the current path we were on and direction to the trade ministers to pursue creative new approaches, both to pursue the issues of Doha, but also new challenges and opportunities on the trading regime. And I think we'll see that at the ministerial that Ambassador Kirk will go to in December to, to begin that process. On APEC, which occurred just this last weekend, I'd say two things. First, there's a lot of good work that gets done throughout the year among the APEC economies. And, and for example, uh, um, they committed a couple years ago to reduce transaction costs uh, of trade in the region by 10%, and they benchmarked themselves and, and believe that they've achieved 5%, that they're halfway there. Similarly, they, they have a, a ease of doing business goal of increasing ease of doing business by 25%, and again, they're, they're making progress on that. At the leaders' meeting itself, there were some important agreements reached uh, in, in various areas. One was about innovation, and basically the APEC economies signed on to a series of innovation principles which underscore the importance of market-driven innovation um, as opposed to indigenous innovation. There was agreement to reduce tariffs to below 5% on a series of environmental goods and services. Uh, which is something we've been trying to get done in Doha and was unable to, and so we tried to pursue it in, in APEC. And there was agreement to, to pursue better regulatory policy, including uh, having centralized regulation, open comment by the public, cost-benefit analysis. It's a series of process improvements that we'll now follow up on there. I would just mention one last thing, because you mentioned business visas. Uh, uh, Congress passed, I, I believe by unanimous consent last week, the APEC business travel card uh, bill, and the President signed it there, and that will 
allow uh, uh, Americans who are part of the global entry program to now get an APEC card, as many of our APEC partners do around the country, around the world, and be able to go through the diplomat and an expedited line in airports all over uh, all over Asia. So it will save you uh, all uh, uh, countless uh, countless hours. It's part of a larger travel initiative of looking at cargo and pre-clearance and passenger information, as well as best practices among airports. So, you know, APEC does a lot of just good nuts and bolts work about improving the flow of, uh, of people and trade across the region. And this was a good meeting for that. That was a small step with a big impact. I mean, that was really that was really key. Listen, uh, just segueing from your discussion to trade and while we have ambassador kirk with us um, lumped together perhaps uh ambassador the russia wto ascension uh the related pntr just one one small example of russia and then lumped that together perhaps with tpp so we can get into a uh, your perspective on all, both of those but the uh you know the eu is about to complete a, uh, an agreement with uh, Russia that takes the 17 percent uh, tariff on aircraft down to zero. WTO uh, ascension will largely accomplish the same thing for us and others. So just in my world, this is huge. 17 percent on, on these big things is a lot of money. And uh, otherwise, we would be uh, significantly disadvantaged uh, versus, uh, versus Airbus. But Look, um, your comments on, on Russia, uh, PNTR, and uh, TPP would be greatly appreciated. We want to get behind you. Okay, well, I'm happy to do that. First of all, I, I have to begin by saying thank you uh, to members of the PEC uh, for your extraordinary support in helping us get the trade agreements with Korea, Panama, and Colombia done. That was a collective, you know, victory for all of us in the sense that success has a thousand fathers so thanks to you all and I say that because it really the the the, the energy the lift from that uh, was noticeable was tangible in our discussions in APEC in um, validating what some people are and I wouldn't say a shift but our expression of our aspirations throughout the Asia Pacific it was just invaluable to our discussions on that and TPP and everything else and it did sort of uh, put to bed this notion somehow the United States had, was ambivalent about trade and didn't have the political will uh, to make some of these tough decisions. So the fact that we did it, the fact that we got them all passed with record amounts, and I appreciate Congressman Reichert, he, he was, was, was working his rear end off on all of these, really, <laughs> really helped us um, um, to get that. But let me tell I'll take, um, maybe I'll work from the back since Mike took care of um, um, APEC, um, we have um, gotten to a point that the working part of report in Geneva on Russia was adopted next week, which means that it is almost a certainty that Russia will be invited to join the WTO Sorry. at our December ministerial. Um, thanks to Ambassador Sapiro, the United was States good. was largely responsible for that because of the work we did in the year following President Medvedev's visit last year that we really worked hard to resolve our issues. Now our challenge, um, and at the risk of, of validating some people's opinion that uh, we have become a part of the marketing sales arm of Boeing. Uh, but Jim <laughs> did give us, you know, our real world challenge is that now in a very compressed congressional calendar, we are going to have to deal with this issue of revoking Jackson Vanek so that we can extend permanent normal trade relations to Russia. Otherwise, we're in a unique position. Almost everybody in Geneva gives us credit for sort of pushing this over the hill. We don't revoke Jackson Vanek, then we have to invoke something called non-application, which means we don't get the benefit, which would be horrible. Uh, now, we'll have a little bit of time once Russia's voted in procedurally. There, Duma has to do some things to implement uh, the legislation, but I would not want to play uh, the lottery with how quickly Russia might do that versus not just Jim, but a number of our businesses been in the position yeah. you heard where the rest of the world's getting the economic benefit from that, uh, but we know. So one, we're going to really need you all's help in getting a Congress that may have a little bit of trade fatigue uh, and certainly not ready to go through this experience on Russia. One important message you can help us get, because what we hear from a lot of members is that, listen, Kirk, you all told us the same thing when we let China in 
and look what happened to us. But in all of our discussions here, what you've heard is some um, reference, and, and, and Alan made a wonderful reference to it, is that we've learned from our experiences on China and other agreements, and that's what we're trying to incorporate in everything, in TPP and APEC, and certainly with respect to Russia. And one of the important changes we made was China had very long periods of time to implement many of its commission commitments. In the case of Russia, we've required them to do probably 80, 90 percent of them up front. So if we can just help people understand this is a different world. We did learn from China, but this is also an extraordinary opportunity for us to bring the largest economy not in the rules-based trading system into it. And then we have the added benefit, following up on Andrew's point, of now at least we have a way to hold Russia accountable, where right now we just sit around and sort of complain about their behavior. Mike referenced a little bit the discussion about Doha that grew out of um, the G20 meeting in Cairns. There is a, a has been a, a um, moment of clarity uh, in Geneva, even though it took a lot of our partners a while to get there, uh, that it just doesn't make sense to keep trying to force ourselves down a road that has not taken us where we want to go. Uh, and so we will be seeking in the, common, the, the, the coming months to look at all other strategies that help us advance liberalization. And one of the main points the United States has pressed is that we have to move away from linking the value of the WTO singularly to whether or not Doha passes. Because in a world in which there's been an explosion of multilateral and bilateral trade agreements, the policing enforcement effort of the World Trade Organization becomes that much more important. And again, that's borne out in the comments of many of you about the non-tariff barriers and others. And so there is plenty of valuable work to be done. And one of the elements that came out of APEC again, because of the strong urging of this body, is the leaders embracing the notion of looking more aggressively at what we can use do to expand modified intellect, the ITA, for example, as an area that we can move forward. So you'll see a lot of the work and a lot of the thought um, that have been socialized here uh, in the PEC beginning to be reflected in our work there. Finally, um, I would say, and not, not to be too parochial, I think the biggest uh, success story coming out of uh, the APEC summit was uh, the movement of our leaders uh, embracing, acknowledging the broad outlines of our agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They also set a work plan for us going forward. But again, whether it was our passing Korea and others or this moment of clarity in Doha, we've entered a world now where other economies within the region realize, okay, first of all, these guys are serious about this. This is for real. Uh, it may not, we've gone from some people thinking, well, maybe this will be the only game in town, to some people thinking now, this is going to be the best game in town. And so you saw public expressions of Japan, Mexico, and Canada that they want to begin a press process uh, about thinking about how they might join. Uh, those of us that are already members have welcomed that, but we've also made it plain, if you're going to join, this is going to be a merge into the stream we're going. We are not going to slow down this process. We are not going to lower our ambition. We welcome interest of all of these economies, but understand you're going to have to seek that same level of ambition. Uh, the most interesting thing, and, and I won't name them, is we are now beginning to get offers from non-APEC countries about joining APEC. Um, well, if you knew who some of them were, you might not be so pleased, That's which is why I won't name them. But the good news is this is a great opportunity for us, and going back again to your points about standards and analysis, we can set the level of ambition. It validates our decision to get in when we did. You all as businessmen and women understand the value being first to market. And that's why when we got in and made the decision a year ago that President Obama announced in Singapore, we saw the real value of the United States helping to set the bar really high and elevate standards, protection of intellectual property rights, and corporation of SMEs, many of the ideas that you've told. So uh, I've told everybody there are no gone fishing signs at USTR. We've got <laughs> plenty to do. Uh, the other thing, while I have the floor, we, we left APEC, and Secretary Bryson and I will be leaving in the morning for China for the next session of our Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade address and all issues you all have raised. Um, you've seen in the public comments, and I will only reflect those, but President Obama was 
as forthright publicly and otherwise as he could be that we welcome this partnership with China, but China's got to play by the rules. And we are never going to yield on insisting that our businesses have non-discriminatory access to their markets as we have given them ours. But I mean, the plus side, China is now our number one agriculture market. On our broader goal of the President's Export Initiative, we are well on that pace. We're on pace to reach a record level. Exports are up almost 30% this year. Ag exports may reach $138 billion in what's happening in the commodity world. You can see the promise there. So lots of things going, lots of us to do, but um, the work uh, that we do here at PAC, the ideas you all uh, present to us really do help inform our work. And I hope you're beginning to see the results of that and believe this isn't just where you come make a report. Uh, we ignore it. It really is making a big difference in our policy. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> You're on a roll. You're on a roll. Well, we, <laughs> and we, we want to bask in the reflected glory. <laughs> Good stuff. Hey, listen, you know, one of the, one of the things that, always, uh, that you always end with in these discussions on trade agreements is the necessity, the requirement, and the responsibility to communicate to the American people because it's still a tough communications job. There's still miscommunication. And John, I, I know you, I know you wanted to have a thought or two on that one. Well, it, you know, I could say some things about export strategies, but I, what I really want to do is, John, I didn't uh, mean to cut you off. You wanted to say no. something else, sir. Yeah, no, on one thing, and that is the the trade strategies. No, not not. Uh, Listen, what was done, in my judgment, in Hawaii with the extraordinary work of Ron, Mike, and others, and the President, and I was simply, you know, it was an honor for me to be part of this consistently, uh, but I think it's extraordinary, extraordinary, and it's a foundation for the future that, to me, is compelling, and as Ron, or I should say Ambassador Kirk, said there now is a momentum. There, there really is a force to this that is stunning. So it's not to say there are not a lot of tough steps ahead. There are a lot of tough steps ahead. But, but a kind of foundation has been laid here that is really, really powerful. So, yeah. yeah. Now, Jim, is this the right yeah. thing from time for me to pick up just a little more on the export, or should we? Sure. Why, why, why don't you do it? And then. John, can I say one thing? Sure. Yeah. I was trying to maintain the, the liver standard of brevity, uh, but I do, as proud as I am of that we passed them, I do want to remind you, I mean, the good thing is we've never passed three trade agreements before. The challenge means we've never implemented three trade agreements <laughs> at one time. So, you know, just to be sure, we've got an extraordinary amount of work to be done. But again, our team is already engaged. We're, we're working with Korea to make sure they get theirs passed. Ambassador, you keep hearing Mayor Shapiro's name, but folks, she's done an incredible amount of work this year. She was the lead on our Russia um, accession. She handled the Brazil cotton negotiation. She handled the signing of our um, ACTA, which is our new trade and our counterfeiting trade enforcement. And then she also led our team on Panama and Colombia. And so she's already, she just came Gave back. Gave her all the easy ones. South, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> South America. I like, I still like to say I'm very good at delegating. My bride says I'm <laughs> lazy, but either way I get to the same place. But we've got a lot of work to do on implementing, but we've already met with all three of our partners because to get the benefits of these, we obviously need these agreements in place. So we're running on a really fast pace to do those at the same time. We're trying to move forward with TPP and everything else we discussed. Well, thanks for your leadership. Thanks very much. John, did you, did you have a comment on, on export policy that you wanted to make? Yeah, or? just one, uh, sure. only one thing, yep. uh, and that is I want to turn this over to Undersecretary Francisco Sanchez of the International Trade Administration. He's done this. He's done it for a long time. He does it with un, unimaginable energies that are moving around all the, the world all the time, and I could say something to be a lot better if he said it. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Just to say that the International Trade Administration was very pleased to provide the staffing for this uh, market sector analysis. We've taken your recommendations to heart, and the next step for the International Trade Administration is to have very specific action plans as we do our work on non-tariff trade barriers and export promotion. Uh, I look forward to, at the next PEC meeting, giving you reports on how we're doing on these 
action plans. And just very briefly, if I may, Mr. Secretary, on export.gov, thank you for your comments, but let me just say you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, we, we did the benchmarking that Scott mentioned. We shamelessly borrowed from Australia and a few other places, and by mid-year 2012, export.gov will be best in class, not just in the country, but best in class export promotion website in the world. And we look forward to presenting that to the PEC uh, at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Um, I think um, Secretary LaHood will be here in just a minute. Maybe I could cover some administrative details and uh, and then or Scott did you want to say something just just wanted to make one comment sure. on the on the topic that yeah I think Andrew brought up the fact that we're gonna to have to really monitor the job creation Alan and I and others were at the state dinner when President Lee was here he actually challenged the people who voted no on the trade agreements that we're gonna create a lot of jobs we'll show you we we'll create a lot of jobs so I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to track that you know at UPS we've went back and, and monitored the last several trade agreements, and we've averaged a 28% increase in, in volume to those countries versus an average of about mid-single digits before the trade agreements. So I think if each of the countries, or each of the companies, go back and monitor this, we need to help, I think, Commerce, so we can sell this. Part of the communications problem. Yeah, get some data. That's a great idea, Scott. Okay, I appreciate your comments there. Um, just, just a couple of... Um, of comments, uh, administrative in nature, uh, while we wait for Secretary LaHood. Me uh, meeting dates for next year, I'm sure your staff's have given them to you, but June 6th and December 6th. So you only have to remember June and December. Sixth <laughs> is the same for both months. Uh, and we still are hopeful of scheduling a trip to Brazil. Uh, right now we're kicking around some uh, dates in March uh, and uh, but stay tuned. I think uh, I think we have to discuss it with the new secretary, <laughs> who uh, 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 for whom things are a blur right now. So I think we'll we'll, we'll settle down and do that. Uh, if it works for the group, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, good. And the uh, SME roundtables. This is what I was thinking of. Gene, in his tireless effort to reach out uh, locally uh, with a big agenda. We're thinking about Chicago and New Orleans, and I know, I know there'll be some announcements, announcements coming out, and I know we'll all try to support it. That works for us. Okay, good. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, we don't. Uh, what's that? We have a statement. Oh, yeah, excuse me. I have one more thing I can do. We have a statement that uh, actually this is sort of consistent with the uh, uh, the stoplight thought. We've got a. We've got a statement that uh, sort of threads the needle between uh, shamelessly discussing what we've accomplished and the modesty that should, should go with hard effort and hard work. So we've commented in a statement. It's in front of you. If there are, any, if there are no objections, we'll go ahead and, and uh, this statement has been worked with, uh, with people who are important and like it. So unless, unless there's something. If there's something you want to put your body in front of, we will now adopt the statement. Thank you. I think it's I think it's uh, it's appropriate. And um, do we uh, maybe maybe we could have Pat and Scott lead a little discussion on infrastructure in in sort of in place of Secretary uh, the Hood, uh, because I think you two are going to make some comments in support of it. Maybe you could add a little information to your comments uh, that would s supplement or, or, or would take the place of an actual presentation on it. So. Is Secretary LaHood joining us? Yes, he is. Is he? Should we wait? To All right. All right. Yeah, we're hurting. Hey. Hello. Perfect Mr. Timing. Mr. Secretary, good to have you here. Yeah, Jim McNerney, good to see you. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Perfect timing. We're uh, we have literally completed all other business, uh, with the exception of your comments on on, on infrastructure, and uh, we very much look forward to it. And we have a couple of people who uh, have, would like to weigh in and good in anticipated support of what you're about to say. So. Well, thank you. 
thank you, and I'm sorry I'm late, and I appreciate uh, very much the opportunity to say a few words about what we've been doing for the last uh, two and a half years. The president really has focused a lot on infrastructure, and uh, we spent a lot of time traveling the country promoting the idea that infrastructure really does create jobs. I think I've been to 48 states and over 200 cities. I've traveled with the president on a number of occasions when we've talked about building roads, building bridges, building transit systems, building ports. I'm very proud of the fact that at DOT we used our Tiger money to invest in 13 ports. That's 13 more ports than have ever been invested in in any administration uh, because we believe ports are a real economic engine. I was in Savannah, Georgia yesterday and talked about uh, the port there and investing in the port there. Uh, we've also um, uh, taken uh, our, our Tiger money uh, and really invested in, in, in opportunities uh, for uh, what we believe is the best freight rail system uh, in America. Uh, we're the envy of the world when it comes to freight rail. Uh, and we selfishly invested almost a half a billion dollars in freight rail because it helps us with the president's vision to implement high-speed rail in America. We've put over $500 million into the freight rail, give them a chance to fix up their infrastructure, their tracks, and other infrastructure so that we've been able over the last two years to enter into agreements with our friends in freight rail so we can use their lines when they're not using them and get trains to higher speeds. We don't, there's obviously not enough money to build all the infrastructure we need for high-speed rail. So we need our friends in freight rail. And the money we've invested is a very good investment of taxpayer money. The other thing the president has talked about for two and a half years and included in the American Jobs Act is a $10 billion infrastructure bank. When you look at the kind of money that you can uh, really leverage with an infrastructure bank, it's millions of dollars. <clears throat> the president proposed an infrastructure bank to, to leverage money uh, not just for roads and bridges, but for water treatment plants, for sewage treatment plants, to fix up the locks and dams. You know, Congress has passed word of bills, but they've never put the money behind it. So we have 50-year-old locks and dams that are antiquated, that need to be fixed up. We have communities all over America that need their water treatment, sewage treatment plants. They don't have the money. And the $10 billion in the American Jobs Act for an infrastructure bank would leverage millions of dollars. We have proved it with our TIFI alone that we have, where we've leveraged a lot of money uh, with communities. Uh, and uh, the president really believes in the infrastructure bank. We need, we need, to, we need to convince our friends in Congress, and I, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to look at you, Congressman, but you seem the only big one here. <laughs> but, but Congress needs to get, get with the program here. The amount of money that can be leveraged with an infrastructure bank is extraordinary. And um, so ports, our friends in freight rail, uh, the money that uh, we think we can leverage um, with an infrastructure bank, the money that we've leveraged uh, with TIFIA, um, really getting the country uh, into high-speed rail, all of these are activities that we've been involved with. Um, I, I just had a meeting with the President uh, last week where we talked about infrastructure, and the two things he said to me, keep pushing infrastructure. Infrastructure equals jobs. It's a no-brainer. I served in Congress for 14 years. I served on the Transportation Committee for six of those 14. We passed two bills, two transportation bills, with over 400 votes. Transportation has never been partisan, ever. And now is the time, really, for us to say to the Congress, pass a transportation bill and you'll put people to work next construction season, building ports, building roads, building bridges, building, uh, enhancing our freight rail system. Uh, and uh, it's a way to really get America back to work pretty easily. And we've always done it in America. That's the way we've always done it, in a bipartisan way. And uh, so we're going to keep pushing for it. And uh, we appreciate any support we can get from all of you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Pat, did you want to make a comment? Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Well, Mr. Secretary, first of all, thank you thank for you. your comments and being here. Um, I'd like to put another equal sign there because, of course, we're here as the President's Export Council. And we've had some discussions today where exports equal jobs. So infrastructure equals exports equals jobs. Obviously, the rivers, dams, 
locks and dams, waterways, ports, freight, rail, et cetera, all at the beginning of a very long export logistics chain. So part of our letter uh, was, of course, to encourage the very things you're talking mm -hmm. about. So prioritizing some of these projects as they relate to exports is one of the additions I'd like to uh, suggest in, sure. in your yeah, many well, comments. You know, as, as, as I've said, we, we've made, this administration has made a lot of investments in ports. And we also uh, created a plan called the, um, uh, the, um, the waterway plan where we actually use the waterways along the ports uh, as a means of transportation. And um, that, the other thing that we've done, we've convened two port summits with all the port directors from all over the country, one in San Diego, one in Chicago. We got them all together. What can we do to be helpful? Uh, with the expansion of the Panama Canal, when I was in Savannah yesterday, Savannah, Georgia, it's the second largest port in America. And it's only going to get bigger when the Panama Canal expands. And uh, so we need to continue to make these investments, and, um, and we will do that. We're committed to doing that. Thank you. Uh, Scott, did you want to comment? Well, I strongly support the, uh, yep. the Secretary's investment in infrastructure. I, I recently hosted Secretary Geithner in Louisville, Kentucky, where we just finished a $2 billion expansion of our air hub there. And compared to the fact that government has to do the same thing, U.S. has to do the same thing. If we're going to double exports in five years, we have to invest in the ports and the rail. We, we, in 2007, to 2008, when things were growing, obviously there was too much congestion. You know, at UPS, we take goods off of trucks and put them on, on, on rail for, for uh, movements over 1,000 miles because it's, it's better for the carbon footprint. It's better for the, for the environment. It's more efficient. Uh, but if it gets too crowded, too congested, then we can't do it. Put it we'll put it back on, on the highways. The other thing on the highway side of things, uh, for five minutes a day, uh, if UPS trucks are, are delayed five minutes a day, it costs $100 million a year. That's just mm. one fleet. That's just mm. our fleet. So you add, you add the rest of the fleets. You add the, you know, the people commuting every day. It's, it's incredible the cost of this country. And the last thing, just to support FAA reauthorization. You know, we didn't talk about Amen. air traffic control. I mean, I, I preach to the choir, but we have to invest in our air traffic control. We've you know, got 1950s technology. We're worried about our carbon footprint. And we've got 747 yep. circling because it allows the air yep. traffic control. The most ridiculous thing, the most ridiculous thing is that we are on a 22nd extension of FAA. We've gone five and a half years without an FAA bill. And for all the great talk for politicians around here talking about getting the next generation technology, which will guide planes more safely, save a lot of jet fuel, relieve congestion, particularly in the New York airspace, we can't do that on a 30-day extension. We'll never get to next gen. We have a good plan. We need the resources. We need a five-year bill. We need Congress to pass. A, a, a five-year bill. Give us a blueprint. You're, you're absolutely right about this. This is great for, we have the safest and the best aviation system in the world. But we're going to be second here pretty soon if we continue another extension of the FAA, if we don't get a five-year bill. Uh, we agree. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 we have tried to line up behind infrastructure development, but I think we can do it more forcefully in some of our recommendations. And, and the way you talked about it, Scott and Pat, a direct linkage to the export capacity of this country is a good way to link it and get behind this agenda. So you have a commitment to do that. Thank you. Yeah, you have a commitment. Yes. Well, I need this response. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. Uh, I just committed on behalf of all of you. I, oh, thank uh, you, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, well, I didn't. We need Ray back in Congress yeah. now. He's got all this, <laughs> all this, all this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. I want to do something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, <laughs> well, I have the same frustration you know. have, Ray. And uh, uh, we are, uh, in, you know, in Seattle, uh, really recognize your effort, want to compliment you on your work and the administration's work and focusing on the infrastructure because I couldn't agree more. I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with the fact that, um, you know, our infrastructure, both uh, roadways, waterways, railways, our electrical grid, uh, it, you can go on and on, is in dire need of repair and attention. And uh, Congress needs to move uh, on those uh, items quickly. So I will 
do that tomorrow. I'll get that all done tomorrow. Um, but I, I've recognized, uh, you know, in Washington State specifically, and, and uh, uh, Jim, you'll, you'll recognize this too. UPS obviously recognizes this. We've got gridlock. Uh, most, most of the port the cities do. Uh, our port is dealing with a specific issue of harbor maintenance tax, which you're probably f mm -hmm. fully aware of. Yep. And uh, our office, uh, you know, as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, we are working on right now on a fix for the harbor maintenance uh, issue that we're going to move forward on um, here in the next week or so. So we, we are trying to, to move things, but um, I think there's a, sort of a holding pattern, super committee work and CRs and how complicated that all is. But, uh, you know, everyone, I can tell you that everyone in Congress really feels the, the pressure uh, to, to, to move forward, to work together, and to get something done. So uh, okay. I'll commit to that on behalf of my colleagues. <laughs> do what I, what, what I can do and, and get them to move along with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Um, I think, uh, Ursula, Mr. Secretary, any final comments before adjournment? Or should we just move adroitly to it? I adjournment? have none. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I just say thanks. This is fabulous. It's great, it's great, to, have, great to have you join us. Uh, Without further ado, meeting is adjourned. Yeah, yeah, yeah.